say what the, what the statement is? Um, I, I forget what the exact form of it was. Um, the question is, um, after all sorts of interesting technological things uh, happen at some undetermined point in the future, are we going to see um, a sort of very small nucleus that, um, be, that, 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 that can or does control like all the resources, or do we see like a sort of general, more civilization-wide um, large fraction of, uh, of, of society participating in all these things going down and can, so do you want to do I, th I think if I remember it, it was compared to the industrial and farming revolutions uh, in the, the fir intelligence explosion first movers will soon dominate a larger fraction of the future world. That's there what I remember. There was a whole debate <laughs> to get to this data. <laughs> right, so four We'll try is, to explain what those mean. Four is saying that you believe that the first movers will gain a large lead relative to first movers in the industrial and farming revolution. Right. So that's, if you agree with that statement, you're four. On this side. <laughs> you think it's going to be more broad-based. Come on. Like, okay. it, it, maybe one word thing would be highly centralized. Highly decentralized. Does that sound like a well, one word? It has to be a cutoff in between highly centralized. <laughs> There's a middle ground. <laughs> and with, 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 the, with, with the cutoff point being the, the, industri the, the agricultural revolution, for example. Or, or no, that's actually like not the cutoff point. That's your side. <laughs> so on the yellow sheet, if, if you're in favor, you write your name, and I'm in favor. If you're against, you write your name, and I'm against. And then pass them that way. Uh, keep the colored sheet, and that's going to be your vote afterwards. And Eliezer and Robin are hoping to convert you. Or have fun. What? Or have fun. Try. Um, we're uh, very excited at Jane Street today to have uh, Eliezer Yankowski, Robin Hanson. short so we can jump into the debate. Uh, both very highly regarded intellectuals and uh, have been airing this debate for some time, so it, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, professor at uh, George Mason University of Economics, one of the frontiers in prediction markets all the way back to 1988. Uh, you know, avid publisher, uh, both uh, co-founder of Overcoming Bias. Um, now uh, moved over to Less Wrong. Well, I moved over to Less Wrong and now he's yeah. at Overcoming Bias. Um, Eliezer, uh, co-founder of the Singularity Institute. Um, many, many publications. Uh, without further ado, on to the debate and uh, the uh, first five minutes. OK, so, <laughs> so quick question. Um, how many people here are sort of already familiar with, say, the differences between what Ray Kurzweil means when he uses the word singularity and the difference between what the Singularity Institute means when they use the word singularity. Right? Raise your hand if you're already familiar with the difference. Okay, I don't see a sea of hands. That means that I designed this talk correctly. So you've probably run across a word singularity. People use it with a lot of different and mutually incompatible meanings. Um, when we named the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence in 2000, it meant something pretty different then than now. Um, so the original meaning was a mathematician and science fiction writer named Werner Vinge originally coined the word singularity to describe the breakdown in his ability to model and imagine the future when he tried to extrapolate that model past the point where it predicted the technological creation of smarter than human intelligence. Um, in this particular case, he was trying to write a story about a human with a brain-computer interface increasing his intelligence, and the rejection letter he got from John Campbell um, said, Sorry, you can't write this story, neither can anyone else. If you asked an a, um, ancient Greek from 2,000 years ago to imagine the modern world, well, pardon me, about 2,500 years ago, to imagine the modern world, um, in point of fact, they wouldn't be able to. But they'd have much better luck imagining our world and would manage to get more things right than, say, a chimpanzee would. There are stories from thousands of years ago that still resonate with us today because the minds, the brains, haven't really changed over that time. And if you change the brain, the mind, that implies a difference in the future that is different in kind from faster cars, 
or interplanetary travel, or curing cancer, or bionic arms, or similar such neat, cool technological trivia, um, because that would not really have an impact on the future comparable to the rise of human intelligence 50,000 years ago. The other thing is that since intelligence is the source of technology, that is, this is ultimately the, the factor that produces the chairs, the floor, the projectors, this computer in front of me. If you tamper with this, then you would expect that to ripple down the causal chain. And in other words, if you make this more powerful, you get a sort of different kind of technological impact than, than you get from any one breakthrough. I.J. Good, another mathematician, um, coined a related concept of the singularity when he pointed out that if you could build an artificial intelligence that was smarter than you, it would also be better th than you at designing and programming artificial intelligence. So this AI builds an even smarter AI, or, you know, or instead of a whole other AI just reprograms modules within itself, then that AI builds an even smarter one, and according to, and I.J. Good s suggested that you'd get a positive feedback loop uh, leading to what I.J. Good termed ultra-intelligence, but what is now generally called super-intelligence, and the general phenomenon of smarter minds um, building even smarter minds is what I.J. Good termed the intelligence explosion. Uh, you could get an intelligence explosion out of, <coughs> outside of AI, um, for example, humans with brain-computer interfaces designing the next generation of brain-computer interfaces, um, but the purest and fastest form of the intelligence explosion seems to be likely to be an AI rewriting its own source code. Um, so this is what the Singularity Institute is actually about, and if we'd foreseen what the word singularity was going to turn into, we'd have called ourselves the Good Institute or the Institute for Carefully Programmed Intelligence Explosions. <laughs> um, here at the Institute for Carefully Programmed Intelligence Explosions, we do not necessarily believe or advocate that, for example, there was more change in the 40 years between 1970 and 2010 than the 40 years between 1930 and, and 1970. Um, I myself do not have a strong opinion that I could, I could argue on this subject, but our president, Michael Vosser, our major donor, Peter Thiel, and Thiel's friend, Casper, who I believe recently spoke here, um, all believe that it's obviously wrong that that technological change has been accelerating at all, let alone that it's been accelerating exponentially. And this doesn't contradict the basic thesis that we would advocate because you do not need exponentially accelerating technological progress to eventually get an AI. You just need some form of technological progress, period. Um, so when we try to visualize um, how all this is likely to go down, we tend to visualize a scenario that someone else once termed a brain in a box in a basement. And I love that phrase, so I stole it. Um, in other words, we tend to visualize that there's this AI programming team, a lot like the sort of wannabe AI programming teams you see nowadays, um, trying to create artificial general intelligence like the artificial general intelligence projects you see nowadays and they managed to acquire some new deep insights which combined with published insights in the general scientific community, uh, let them go down to their basement and work on it for a while and create an AI which is smart enough to reprogram itself and then you get an intelligence explosion. Um, one of the strongest critics of this particular concept of a localized intelligence explosion is Robin Hansen. In fact, it's probably fair to say that he is the strongest critic by around an order of magnitude and a margin so large that there's no, no obvious second contender. <laughs> and how much time do I have left in my five minutes? Does anyone know? Or? You just hit five minutes, but... All right, in that case, I'll turn you over to Robin. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be very flexible here going back and forth, so there'll be plenty of time. Uh, I thank you for inviting us. Uh, I greatly respect this audience and my uh, esteemed debate opponent here. We know each other for a long time. We respect each other. We've talked for a lot. It's uh, a lot of fun to talk about this here with you all. Uh, the key question here, as we agree, is this idea of a local intelligence explosion. That's what the topic's about. So we're not talking about this idea of gradually accelerating change where in 30 years everything you've ever heard about will all be true or more. We're talking about a world where we've had relatively steady change over a century, roughly, and we might have steady change for a while, and then the hypothesis is there'll be this sudden dramatic event with great consequences, and the issue is what is the nature of that event and how will it play out? Um, so this brain in a box in a basement scenario is where a, something that starts out very small very quickly becomes very big. And the way it goes from being small to be very big is it gets better. It gets more powerful. And so in an essence, during this time, this thing in the basement is outcompeting the entire rest of the world. Now, as you know, or maybe you don't know, 
The world today is vastly more powerful than it has been in the past. Uh, the long-term history of your civilization, your species, has been a vast increase in capacity. From primates to humans with language, eventually developing farming, then industry, and who knows where. Uh, over this very long time, uh, lots and lots of things have been developed, lots of innovations have happened, and there's lots of big stories along the line, but the major overall standing from a distant story is of relatively steady gradual growth. That is, there's lots of inventions here, changes there uh, that add up to disruptions, but most of the disruptions are relatively small and on the distant scale there's relatively steady growth. And it's more steady even on the larger scale. So if you look at a company like yours or, or a city even like this, you'll have ups and downs or even a country, but on the long time scale. And this is sort of central to the idea of where innovation comes from. And that's sort of the central, this center of this debate really. Where does innovation come from? Where can it come from? And how fast can it come? So the brain in the box in the basement, within a relatively short time, a huge amount of innovation happens. That is, this thing hardly knows anything, it's hardly able to do anything, and then within a short time, it's able to do so much that it basically can take over the world and do whatever it wants, and that's the problem. So now let me stipulate right from the front, there's a chance he's right, okay? And somebody ought to be working on that chance. And so he looks like a good candidate to me. So I'm fine with him working on this chance. Uh, I'm fine with there being a bunch of people working on the chance. My only dispute is sort of the perceptions of probability. Some people seem to think this is like the main, most likely thing that's going to happen. I think it's a small chance that's worth looking into and protecting against. So we agree all there. So our dispute is more about the chance of this scenario. Um, if you remember the old Bond villain, he had an island somewhere with jumpsuited minions, all wearing the same color if I call, recall. And they had some device they invented and Bond had to go in and, and put it off. And usually they had invented a whole bunch of devices back there and they just had a whole bunch of stuff going on. And sort of the epitome of this might be Captain Nemo from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. One guy off on his own island with a couple of people invented a, the entire submarine technology, if you believe the movie, Undersea Cities, uh, nuclear weapons, et cetera, all within a short time. Now, that makes wonderful fiction. <laughs> You like to have a great, powerful villain that everybody can go, you know, fight and take down. But in the real world, it's very hard to imagine somebody isolated on an island with a few people sort of inventing large amounts of technology, innovating that sort of compete with the rest of the world. In Bond stories, that's just not going to happen. It doesn't happen in the real world. In, in our world so far in history, it's been very rare for any one local place to have such a advantage in technology that it really could do anything remotely like take over the world. And in fact, if we look for major disruptions in history of which might be parallel to what's being hypothesized here, the three major disruptions we might think about would be the introductions of something special about humans, perhaps language, the introduction of farming and the introduction of industry. Those three events, whatever was special about them, we're not sure, but for those three events, um, the growth rate of the world economy suddenly, within a very short time, changed from something that was slow to something 100 or more times faster. And so we're not sure exactly what those were, but those would be candidate as things I would call singularities, that is, big, enormous disruptions. But in those singularities, the places that first had the new technology uh, had varying degrees of how much of an advantage they gave. So uh, Edinburgh gained some advantage by being the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, but it didn't take over the world. Uh, Northern Europe did more like take over the world, but even then it's not so much taken over the world. Uh, Edinburgh and parts of Northern Europe needed each other. They needed a large economy to build things together. Uh, and so that limited, and also people could copy. Even in the farming revolution, it was more like a 50-50 split between the initial farmers spreading out and taking over territory and the other locals copying them and being interbreeding with them. If you go all the way back to the introduction of humans, that was much more about one displaces all the rest because there was relatively little way in which they could help each other, uh, complement each other, or share technology. So what the issue here is, and obviously I'm about, I've done with my five minutes, is in this new imagined scenario, how plausible is it that something that's very small could have that much of an advantage that it, whatever it has that's new and better gives it such an advantage that it can grow from something that's small on an 
even town scale to being bigger than the world, uh, when it's competing against the entire rest of the world, when in these previous innovation situations when even the most disruptive things ever happened, still the new first mover only gained a modest advantage in terms of being a larger fraction of the new world. So I'll end my five minutes there. So the fundamental question of rationality is, what do you think you know and how do you think you know it? So this is a rather interesting and in fact it's rather embarrassing because it seems to me like there's very strong reason to believe that we're going to be looking at a localized intelligence explosion. Um, Robin, Hansen feels, Robin Hansen seems like there's pretty strong reason to believe that we're going to be looking at a um, non-local um, general economic growth mode changeover. I mean, calling it singularity seems to, so, you know, like, so, like putting them all into the category singularity is uh, slightly sort of begging the definitional question. Uh, I would prefer to like sit, call, talk about the intelligence explosion um, as a possible candidate for the reference class economic growth mode changeovers. Okay. Well, the, the embarrassing part is that both of us know the theorem, which shows that two rational agents cannot agree, have common knowledge of disagreement, called Amund's agreement theorem. So we're supposed to, since we know we, the, the other person like believes something different, we're supposed to have agreed by now, but we haven't. It's really quite embarrassing. <laughs> um, so, so the, but the underlying question is if is the sort of next big thing going to look more like the rise of human intelligence, or is it going to look more like the industrial revolution? And um, so if you look at modern AI projects, um, the leading ones, the, the sort of the leading edge of artificial intelligence does not look like the product of a economy among AI projects. They tend to rewrite their own code they tend to not use very much cognitive content from other, that other AI projects have developed. They've been known to import libraries that have been published, but you couldn't look at that and say that an AI project which just used what had been published and then developed its own further code would suffer a disadvantage analogous to a country that tried to go its own way for the rest of the world economy. Um, it, r rather, AI projects nowadays look a lot like species which only share genes within a species, and then the other species are all off going their own way. So um, what is your vision of the development of intelligence or technology where things are getting traded very quickly, the analogous so, to global economy? So let's back up and, and make sure we aren't losing people with some common terminology. Um, I believe that, like most of you do, that in the near future, within a century, we will move more of the knowledge and intelligence in our society into machines. That is, machines have a lot of promise as hardware substrate for intelligence. Uh, they are, you can copy them, you can uh, reproduce them, you can make them uh, go faster, you can have them in environments. So we are in complete agreement that eventually uh, hardware, non-biological hardware, silicon, things like that, will be a more dominant substrate of where intelligence resides. And by intelligence, I just mean whatever mental capacities exist that allow us to do mental tasks. So we are a powerful civilization able to do many mental tasks, primarily because we rely heavily on bodies like yours with heads like yours, where a lot of that stuff happens inside biological heads. But we agree that in the future, there will be much more of that happening in machines. The question is the path to that situation. Now, our heritage, our sort of what we have as a civilization, a lot of it is a lot of the things inside people's heads. And they are things that part of it isn't what peop in, in people's heads 50,000 years ago, but some of, a lot of it is also just what was in people's heads 50,000 years. We have this common heritage of brains and minds that go back millions of years through animals and built up with humans, and that's part of our common heritage. And there's a lot in there. Human brains contain an enormous amount of things. It's not, I think it's not just one or two clever algorithms or something. It's this vast pool of resources. It's like comparing it to a city like New York City. New York City is a vast, powerful thing because it has lots and lots of stuff in it. So when you think in the future there will be these machines and they will have a lot of intelligence in them, that one of the key questions is where will all of this vast mental capacity that's inside them come from? And where Eliezer and I differ, I think, is that I think uh, we all have this vast capacity in our heads, and these machines are just way, way behind us at the moment, 
And basically, they have to somehow get what's in our head transferred over to them somehow. Uh, because if you just put one box in a basement and ask it to rediscover the entire world, it's just way behind us. And unless it has some almost inconceivable advantage over us at learning and growing and discovering things for itself, uh, it's just going to remain way behind unless there's some way it can inherit what we have. OK. So I um, gave a talk here at Jane Street that was on the speed of evolution. Um, I, raise your hand if you were here for this and remember some of it. OK. So there's a, there's a single, simple algorithm which produced um, the design for the human brain. Um, it's not a very good algorithm. It's extremely slow. It took it millions and millions and billions of years to cough up this artifact over here. Um, you can e it, it, like evolution is so simple and so slow that we can even make mathematical statements about how slow it is, um, so, such as the like two separate bounds that I've seen cal calculated for how fast evolution can work. One of which is on the order of one bit per generation, in the sense that if, on average, like two parents have eight children. And then, let's say, two parents have 16 children. Then on average, all but two of those children must die or fail to reproduce if the population goes to zero or infinity very rapidly. So 16 cut down to two, that would be three bits of selection pressure per generation. There's another argument which says that it's faster than this. But if you actually look at the genome, then we've got about like 30,000 genes in here. Um, most of our 750 megabytes of DNA is rep repetitive and almost certainly junk, um, as best we understand it. And the brain is simply not a very complicated artifact by, the, by comparison to, say, Windows Vista. Now, the, com the complexity that it does have, it uses a lot more effectively than Windows Vista does. It probably contains a number of design principles, which Microsoft knows not. But, none but nonetheless, the um, sort of the, the, what I'm trying to say, you know, I'm not, and I'm not saying that it's that small because it's 750 megabytes. I'm saying it's got to be that small because most of this, like at least 90 percent of the 750 megabytes is junk, and there's only 30,000 genes for the whole body, never mind the brain. That something that simple can be this powerful and this hard to understand is a shock. But there, um, if you sort of look at the brain design, it's got, you know, like. 52 major areas in each side of the cerebral cortex, um, distinguishable by sort of the local pattern, the tiles, and so on. It just doesn't really look all that complicated. It's very powerful. It's very mysterious. What we can say about it is that it probably involves 1,000 different deep major mathematical insights into the nature of intelligence that we need to comprehend before we can build it. So this is um, probably one of the sort of more, more intuitive, less, uh, less easily quantified and argued by reference to large bodies of experimental evidence type thing. It's more a sense of, well, you read through the MIT Encyclopedia of the Cognitive Sciences, and um, you know, like you read Judea Pearl's uh, Probabilistic Reasoning Intelligence Systems, and you know, like you want, so here's a insight. It's an insight into the nature of causality. Uh, how many more insights of this size do we need, given that this is what the MIT Encyclopedia of Cognitive Sciences seems to indicate we already understand and what it doesn't? And you sort of take a gander on it and you say, there's probably about 10 more insights, not, definitely not one, not 1,000, probably not 100 either. Um, so so let, uh, let's clarify what's at issue. Um, the question is, what makes your human brain powerful? Uh, most people who look, look at the brain and compare it to other known systems have said things like it's the most complicated system we know or things like that. So automobiles are also powerful things, but they're vastly simpler than the human brain, at least in terms of the fundamental constructs. Uh, but the question is what makes the brain powerful? Because we won't have a machine that competes with the brain until we have it have whatever the brain has that makes it so good. So the key question is what makes the brain so good? And I think our dispute in part comes down to an inclination toward architecture or content. That is, uh, one view is that there's just a clever structure. And if you have that basic structure, you have the right sort of architecture, and you set it up that way, then you don't need very much else. You just give it some sense organs, some access to the internet or something, and then it can grow and build itself up because it has the right architecture for growth. And here we mean architecture for growth in particular. What architecture will met, let this thing grow well? Uh, so Eliezer hypothesizes that there are these insights out there, and you need to find them. And when you find enough of them, then you can have something that 
competes well with the brain at growing because you have enough of these architectural insights. My opinion, which I think many AI experts will agree, <laughs> at least, uh, including, say, Doug Lennett, who uh, did the Eurisco program that you most admire <laughs> in AI, is that it's largely about content. There are architectural insights, there are sort of high-level things that you can do right or wrong, but they don't, in the end, add up to enough to make vast growth. What you need for vast growth is simply to have a big base. So in the world, there are all these nations. Some are small, some are large. Large nations can grow larger because they start out large. <laughs> Uh, cities like New York City can grow larger because they start out as larger city. If you took a city like New York and you said, New York's a decent city, it's all right, but look at all these architectural failings. Look how this is designed badly or that's designed badly. The roads are in the wrong place or the subways are in the wrong place or the building heights are wrong or the, the pipe format is wrong. Let's imagine building a whole new city somewhere with the right sort of architecture. How good would that better architecture have to be? You clear out some spot in the desert, you have a new architecture, you say, come, come world. We have a better architecture here. You don't want those old cities. You want our new, better city. And I predict you won't get many comers because for cities, architecture matters, but it's not that important. It's just lots of people being there and doing lots of specific things that makes a city better. Similarly, I think that for mines, what matters is that it just has lots of good, powerful stuff in it. Lots of things it knows, uh, routines, uh, strategies, and there isn't that much at the large architectural level. So so the fundamental thing about our modern civilization is that everything you've ever met that you regarded to, that you bothered to regard as any sort of ally or competitor had essentially exactly the same architecture as you. Um, the logic of evolution in a sexually reproducing species, you can't have half the people having a complex machine that requires 10 genes to build because then it will, then if all the individual genes are 50% frequency, the whole thing only gets assembled. Uh, like 0.1% of the time, you know, it everything evolves piece by piece, piecemeal. But this, by the way, is standard evolutionary biology. Um, it, it's not a creationist argument. I thought, just thought I'd emphasize that in case anyone was. Th th this is bog standard evolutionary biology. So everyone you've met has the same, uh, unless they've like suffered specific brain damage or specific genetic deficit, they have all the same machinery as you. They have no complex machine in their brain that you do not have. Um, and um, the, our, our nearest neighbors, the chimpanzees, who have 95% shared DNA with us. Um, now, in, in one sense, that may be a little misleading because what they don't share is probably um, like more heavily focused on brain than body type stuff. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, you, you can look at those brains. You can put the brains through an MRI. They have almost exactly the same brain areas as us. We just have larger versions of some brain areas. And I think there's... Um, I, I, one sort of neuron that we have and they don't, or, or possibly even like they had it, but only in very tiny quantities. Um, this is sort of, and this is because there have been only five million years since we split off from the chimpanzees. There simply has not been time to do any major changes to brain architecture in five million years. It's just not enough to do like really significant complex machinery. We, what the intelligence we have is the last layer of icing on the cake, and yet if you look at the sort of curve of evolutionary optimization into the, the, the sort of hominid line versus how much optimization power it put out, how much horsepower was the intelligence, it goes like this. And then over the, um, so, so if we, we look at the world today, we find that a, taking a little bit out of the architecture produces something that is just not in the running as an ally or a competitor when it comes to doing cognitive labor. They don't, chimpanzees don't really participate in the economy at all, in, in fact, but the, the key point from our perspective is that although they are in a different environment, they grow up learning to do different things. There are genuinely skills that chimpanzees have that we don't, such as being able to um, put, stick, poke a branch into an anthill and draw it out in such a way as to have it covered with lots of tasty ants. Nonetheless, there are no branches of science where the chimps do better because they have mostly the same architecture and more relevant content. Um, I, 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 I think, uh, so it seems to me at least that if we look at the present cognitive landscape, we are getting really strong information that, um, or, or pardon me, I mean like, like, like you can imagine th like we're, we're getting sort of, trying to like reason from one sample or something, but then pretty much all of this is reasoning from one sample in one way or another. We're, we're seeing that um, in this particular case, at least, 
Um, humans can develop all sorts of content that lets them totally outcompete other animal species who have been doing things for millions of years longer than we have by virtue of architecture. And anyone who doesn't have the architecture isn't really in the running for it. So something happened to humans. <laughs> humans are, are, are arguably happy to grant that humans are outcompeting all the rest of the species on the planet. We don't know exactly what it is about humans that was different. We don't actually know how much of it was architecture, in a, in a sense, versus other things. But what we can say, for example, is that chimpanzees actually could do a lot of things in our society, except they aren't domesticated. So a lot of the, the animals we actually use are a very small fraction of the animals out there. It's not because they're smarter, per se. It's because they are just more willing to be told what to do. <laughs> and most animals aren't willing to be told what to do. And so chimps, if chimps would be willing to be told what to do, there's a lot of things we could have them do. Uh, you know, Planet of the Apes would actually be a much more feasible scenario. Uh, so it's not clear that their cognitive abilities are really that lagging, more that their social skills are, are lacking. But the more fundamental point is to say, since a million years ago, when humans probably had language, we are now a vastly more powerful species. And that because we've used this ability to collect content, collect uh, cultural content, and built up a vast society that contains so much more. So I think that if you took humans and made some better architectural innovations to them and put a pile of them off in the forest somewhere, we're still going to outcompete them if they're isolated from us because we just have this vaster base that we have built up since then. Uh, so again, the issue comes down to how important is architecture. So even if something happens such that some architectural thing finally enabled humans to have culture, to share culture, to be, have language, to talk to each other. That was powerful. But the question is, how many more of those are there? Because we have to hypothesize not just that there are one or two, but there are a whole bunch of these things, because that's the whole scenario. Remember, the scenario is box in a basement. Somebody writes the right sort of code, turns it on. This thing hardly knows anything. But because it has all these architectural insights, it can, in a short time, take over the world. So there, there have to be a lot of really powerful architectural Fruit, low-hanging fruit to find in order for that scenario to work. It's not just a few ways in which architectural helps, it's architectural dominates. So I'm not sure I would agree that you need lots of architectural insights like that. I, I mean, like to me, it seems more like you just need one or two. Um, so, But one, one architectural to... insight allows a box in a basement that hardly knows anything to out-compete the entire rest of the world? Well, if you look at humans, they outcompeted the at like sort of everything evolving, as it were. I mean, the in, in the sense that there was this one optimization process, natural selection, that was building up content over millions and millions and millions of years, and then there's this new architecture, um, which can all so, of a sudden generate so humans vast could accumulate culture. But you're thinking there's another thing that's metaculture that these machines will accumulate that we aren't well, accumulating? I, I, I'm, I'm pointing that the time scale for generating content underwent this vast temporal compression. In other words, content that used to take millions of years to right. do. now So, so cultural evolution hours. can happen a lot faster. Well, for one thing, I, I mean, like it's a sort of um, like unimpressively non-abstract observation, but this thing does run at around 2 billion hertz, and this thing runs at about 200 hertz. Right. So if you are, so if you, so if you can have architectural innovations which merely allow this thing to do the same sort of thing that this thing is doing, only a million times faster, um, then that million times faster means that um, the that 31 seconds works out to about a subjective year, and all the time between ourselves and Socrates works out to about eight hours. So it, it, you may, it may yeah, look lots like Lots of it's people have those machines in their basement. So you have to imagine that your basement has something better. They have those machines. You have your machines. Your machine has to have this architectural advantage that beats out everybody else's well, machines but, but, in their but, basement. But no, 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 there's like two sort of separate topics here. Like sort of previously, you, see, you, you did seem to me to be arguing that we just shouldn't expect that much of a speed up. Now we're, now, then there's a separate question of, well, suppose the speed up was possible would one basement get it ahead of other, other basements? So, so to be clear, the dispute here is I grant fully that these machines are wonderful, and we will move more and more of our powerful content to them, and they will execute rapidly and reliably in all sorts of ways to help our economy grow quickly. And in fact, I think it's quite likely that the economic growth rate could accelerate and become much faster. That's with the entire world economy working together, sharing these things, uh, exchanging them, and using them. But now the scenario is in a world where people are using these as best they can, 
with their best software, their best architecture, best software, best approaches for the computers. One guy in a basement has a computer that's not really much better than anybody else's computer in a basement, except that it's got this architectural thing that allows it to, within a few weeks, take over the world. That's the scenario. Well, well, actually, well again, but um, you seem to be sort of like conceding much more probability. I mean, I mean I'm not sure to what degree you like think it's likely, but you do seem to be conceding much more probability that there is in principle some program where if it was like magically transmitted to us, we could take a um, modern day large computing cluster and turn it into something that could generate what you call content a million times faster. And to the extent that that's possible, the whole brain in the box scenario thing does seem to become intuitively more credible. Or to put it another way, if you just couldn't have an architecture better than this, if you couldn't run at faster speeds than this, if all you could do was use the same sort of content that had been laboriously developed over thousands of years of civilization, um, and you couldn't really generate, and there wasn't any way, really any way to generate content faster than that, then the FOOM scenario does go out the window. If, on the other hand, like there's this gap between where we are now and this place where you can generate content millions of times faster, then there is a further issue of whether um, one basement gets that ahead of other basements, but it suddenly does become a lot more plausible that you had a civilization that was ticking along just fine for thousands of years generating lots of content, and then something else came along and just su sort of sucked all, the, all, the con all that content that it was interested in off the internet so, and... So we, we've had computers for a few decades now. So this idea that once we have computers, innovation will speed up, we've already been able to test that idea, right? So computers are useful in some areas uh, as complementary inputs, but they haven't overwhelmingly changed the growth rate of the economy. We've got these devices, they run a lot faster, but where we can use them, we use them. But overall limitations to innovation are much more about uh, having good ideas and trying them out in the right places, and pure computation isn't, in our world, that big an, adv an advantage in doing innovation. Yes, but it hasn't been running this algorithm only faster. It's been running spreadsheet algorithms. And I fully agree that spreadsheet algorithms are not as powerful as the human brain. I mean, I don't know if there's any animal that builds spreadsheets, but if they do, they would not have taken over the world thereby. Um, right, but when you point to your head, you say, this algorithm. What you mean, there's millions of algorithms in there. We are slowly making your laptops include more and more kind of algorithms, a lot of the sorts of things in your head. The question is, will there be some sudden threshold where entire heads go into the laptops all at once, or do they slowly, do laptops slowly accumulate the various kinds of innovations that heads contain? Well, uh, let, let me sort of like try to take it down a sort of level in concreteness. The idea is there are sort of like key insights. You can use them to build an AI. Um, so you've got like a brain in a box in a basement team. They take the key insights, they build the AI. The AI goes out, um, sucks a, a lot of information off the internet. It's duplicating a lot of content that way because it's stored in a form where it can understand it on its own and download it very rapidly and absorb it very rapidly. And then, like in terms of taking over the world, um, you know, like nano, like current, like nanotechnology. That te nanotechnological progress is not that far ahead of its current level. Um, but this AI manages to crack the protein folding problem, so it can email something off to one of those places that will take an email DNA string and FedEx you back the proteins in 70, 72 hours. There are places like this. Yes, we have them now. So, so we, we grant that if there's a box somewhere that's vastly smarter than anybody on Earth or vastly smarter than any million people on Earth, then we've got a problem. But well, the well, question is, how likely is that scenario? No, 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 what, I'm, what I'm trying to s distinguish here is the question of, um, does that potential exist versus is that potential centralized? I mean, if, if, to the extent that, that you say, OK, so there would, in principle, be some way to um, know enough about intelligence that you could build something that could learn and absorb existing content very quickly. I, I, in other words, the, the, the question, I, I want, I'm trying to sort of separate out the question of, how dumb is this thing? How much smarter can you build an agent? Um, if that agent were teleported into today's world, could it take over? Ver versus the question of who develops it, in what order, and or were they all trading insights, or did, was, was it more like a modern day financial firm where you don't show your competitors your, your, your key insights, uh, um, and, and so on, or, or for that matter, modern artificial intelligence programs? So I grant that a head like yours could be filled with lots more stuff such that it would be vastly more powerful. I would call most of that stuff content. You might call it architecture. But if it's a million little pieces, architecture is kind of content. So the, the key idea is, is there like one or two things such that with just those one or two things, your head is vastly, vastly more powerful? Um, OK, so what do you think happened between chimps and humans? I mean, something happened, something additional. But the question is, how many more things are there like that? 
So one obvious thing is just so, so speed, between chimps and do... humans, we develop we, the ability to transmit culture, right? That's the obvious explanation for why we've been able to grow faster. Using language, we've been able to transmit insights and accumulate them socially rather than in the well, genes, right? We, 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 people have tried raising chimps in human surroundings, um, and they absorb this mysterious capacity for abstraction that sets them apart from other chimps. There's this wonderful book about one of these chimps. Uh, Kanzi was his name, very, very famous chimpanzee, probably the world's most famous chimpanzee, and probably the world's smartest chimpanzee as well. They were trying to teach his mother to do these human things. And the, the, you know, he was just a little baby chimp, and he was watching, and he picked stuff up. And, and um, it's amazing, but nonetheless, he did not go on to become the world's leading chimpanzee scientist using his own chimpanzee abilities <laughs> separately. I, I mean, um, you, if you look at human beings, then we have this enormous c processing object containing billions upon billions of neurons, and people still fail the waste and selection test. They cannot figure out which playing cards they need to turn over to verify the rule. If a card has an even number on one side, it has a vowel on the other. Uh, they, they can't figure out which cards they need to turn over to verify that whether this rule is true or false. So, I, so again, we're not distinguishing architecture and content here. So I, I grant that you can imagine boxes the size of your brain that are vastly more powerful than your brain. The question is, what, can, what could get, create a box like that? And the issue here is I'm saying the way something like that happens is through the slow accumulation of improvement over time, the hard way, there's no shortcut of having one magic innovation that jumps you there all at once. I'm saying that I wonder if we should like ask for questions and see if we've lost the audience. By yeah, now. I'm, 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 I'm sort of slightly. I'm, um, I mean, it, it does seem to me a bit that you're sort of equivocating between arguing that the gap doesn't e exist or isn't crossable versus saying the gas the gap is crossed in a decentralized fashion. But but I'm, I agree that like sort of taking a some some sort of question from the audience might help re refocus this. Help us. <laughs> yes. Does anyone want to? We lost you. Voice, please. Uh, so, isn't one of the major advantages that humans have over animals in the prefrontal cortex is more of a design of content? I don't think we know exactly. <laughs> So, so the issue is the scale, the spatial scale on which improvement happens. So uh, for example, if you look at, say, programming languages, a programming language with a lot of users compared to a programming language with a small number of users, the one with a lot of users can accumulate improvements more quickly because there are, <laughs> there are many people, there are the ways you might resist it too, of course, but there are just many people help, who could help improve it. Or similarly with a th uh, something other that gets used by many users, they, they can help improve it. So it's not just what kind of thing it is, but how large a base of people are helping to improve it. R Robin, so, I have a, a slight suspicion that Jane Street Capital is using its own proprietary programming language. Would I right? be correct in that suspicion? Well, Maybe get advantages, but, <laughs> but it's proprietary, esoteric. Esoteric. But it's still, it's a trade-off you have. If you use your own thing, you can be specialized, it can be all yours, but you have fewer people helping to improve it. Uh, so, if we have this brain, the thing in the basement, and it's all by itself, it's not like sharing innovations with the rest of the world in some large research community that's building on each other. It's just all by itself, working by itself. It really needs some other advantage that is huge to counter that. Because <laughs> otherwise, we've got a scenario where people have different basements and different machines, and they each find a little improvement, and they share that improvement with other people, and they include that in their machine, and then other people share, improve theirs, and back and forth, and all the machines get better and faster. Well, present day artificial intelligence does not actually look like that. So you think that um, in 50 years, um, artificial intelligence or, or creating cognitive machines is, is going to look very different than it does right now. Almost every real industrial process pays attention to integration in ways that researchers off on their own trying to do demos don't. Uh, you know, people inventing new cars, they didn't have to make a car that like matched a road and a filling station and, and everything else. They just made a new car and said, hey, here's a car, maybe we should try it. But once you have an automobile industry, you have a whole set of suppliers and manufacturers and re filling stations and repair shops so, and all of this that are matched and integrated to each other. So, so in a large actual, you know, 
economy of smart machines with pieces, they would have standards and there would be strong economic pressures to right, so match those standards. Right, so it's a very definite um, difference of visualization here is that I expect um, the dawn of artificial intelligence to look like someone successfully building a first of its kind AI that is, um, may, may like use a lot of published insights and perhaps even like use some published libraries, but is nonetheless a prototype, it's a one of a kind thing, it was built by a research project. And you're visualizing that at the time interesting things start to happen or maybe even there is no key threshold because there's no storm of recursive self-improvements, you're visualizing just like everyone gets slowly better and better at building smarter and smarter machines. I mean, it is the no sort of Bond right. villain, Captain Nemo on his own island doing everything, re beating out the well, rest of the world, isolated versus an integrated... Or, or, or rise of huh. human intelligence, you know, like one species. Right, but, so, all the but humans species. couldn't... We, do, we, we are not restricted Humans couldn't share examples. with the other species, so there was a real limit. We're there. Well, so so are we actually? So okay, so we got lots of software we don't understand. Sure. But we can still understand it at a very local level. We can still, you know, it's like disassemble it. You know, it's pretty surprising to what extent Windows has been reverse engineered by the millions of programmers who work on it. And but I was going to ask. I would which is not permitting the transfer of information because you can't understand the software, you can't transmit the insight using your own software. So that's not really a, a key part of my visualization. I don't think that, I think that there's a sort of mysterious tendency, um, like people who don't know how neural networks work are very impressed by the fact that you can train neural networks to do something, you don't know how it works, as if your ignorance of how they worked was responsible for making them work better somehow. So I don't think, so, so ceteris paribus, not being able to understand your own software is a bad thing. Um, and I, and I, so I, I, wasn't, I wasn't really visualizing there being a key threshold where non-incomprehensible software is, uh, what's that, okay, so the, the key piece of incomprehensible software in this whole thing is the brain. This thing is not end user modifiable. If something goes wrong, you cannot just swap another, um, you, you can't just swap out one module and plug in another one. Um, and that, that's, that's why you die. You die ultimately because your brain is not end user modifiable and doesn't have IO ports or like hot swappable um, modules or anything like that. Um, so the, the, reason why, the reason why I expect localish sort of things is that I expect one project to sort of go over the threshold for intelligence in much the same way that, that chimps went over the threshold of intelligence and became humans. Yes, I know that's not evolutionarily accurate. Um, and then even though they now, have, they now have this functioning mind to which they can make all sorts of interesting improvements and have it run even better and better, whereas meanwhile all the other cognitive work on the planet is being done by these non end user modifiable human intelligences which cannot really make very good use of the insights, although it is an intriguing fact that after spending some time trying to figure out artificial intelligence, I went off and, and started blogging about human rationality. Uh, so. uh, I, I just wanted to sort of clarify one thing. Would you guys both agree, well I know you would agree, would you agree Robin that in your scenario if one, just imagine one had a time machine that could carry a, a, a physical object the size of this room and you could go forward a thousand years into the future and bring back, essentially create and bring back to the present day an object say the size of this room, that you could take over the world with that? I, I no doubt that. Okay, so the question is sort of how like whether that object, that object. Point of curiosity. Is, is does this work too? Object of this size. Uh, probably. Yeah. It's a great right. I, I'm. I'm <laughs> so. So the question is does, is: does the development of that object essentially happen, like in a very asynchronous way, or more broadly? I, I think I should actually admit that there is a concrete scenario that I can imagine that fits much more of his uh, concerns. So. Uh, 
I think that the main, the most likely way that the content that's in our heads will end up in silicon is something called whole brain emulation, where you take actual brains, scan them, and make a computer model of that brain, and then then you can start to hack them to sort of take out the inefficiencies and speed them up. And uh, if the time at which it was possible to scan a brain and model it sufficiently was a time when the computer power to actually run those brains was very cheap, then you have more of a computing cost overhang where the first person who can manage to do that can then make a lot of them very fast. And then, then you have more of a, a risk scenario. Uh, it's because with emulation, there is this sharp threshold. And, and, and before you, until you have a functioning emulation, you just have shit. Because it okay. doesn't work. And then when you have it, it works. It works as well as any of you, so you can make lots of Right. So, so in other words, we get a like um, sort of centralized economic shock because there's a there's a there's a curve here that, that that has a little step function in it, and if I want if I can like step back and describe what you're describing on a like bit of a higher level of abstraction, you have emulation technology that is being developed all over the world, um, but there's this very sharp threshold in how well the, in, in how well the resulting emulation runs, like as a function of, of like right. how good your emulation technology is, the output of the emulation uh, experiences a sharp threshold, exactly. um, and in particular you might you can even imagine that there's a lab that builds the world's first functioning, first correctly functioning scanner. And then, uh, um, you know, like, like it would be a prototype, one of its kind sort of thing. It would use lots of technology from around the world. And it would be, be very similar to other technology from around the world. But because they got it, you know, this like one little extra gear they added on, right. they are now capable of absorbing all the content in here at an extremely great rate of speed. And that's where the first mover effect would come from. Right. So the key point is, for an emulation, there's this threshold. Uh, you, if you get it almost right, you just don't have something that works. When you finally get enough, then it works, and it, you get all the content through. It's would like you, if, you, if you had some channel of, of our, some aliens were sending a signal, we just couldn't decode their signal. And would, would it was you, just noise, and then finally we figured out the code, and then we've got a high you, bandwidth rate, and they're telling us lots of technology secrets. That would be another sort of analogy. It's sharp threshold where suddenly you get lots of stuff. So, so you expect this, this threshold, so, so you think there's a, very, a like mainline, like higher than 50% probability that we get this sort of threshold with emulations? No, so or, I, so I, it depends or, on which is the last technology to be ready with emulations. So if, if computing is cheap when the thing is ready, then we have this risk. I actually think that's relatively unlikely that the other tech, the computing will still be expensive when the other things are ready. But, um, but, but there'll still be a um, speed of content absorption effect. It just wouldn't give you lots of emulations very quickly. Or right. It wouldn't give you this huge economic power. And, and, and similarly, with chimpanzees, we also have some indicators that at least their ability to do abstract science. There's a similar, like, 90, that there's a, what I like to call the, like, one wrong number um, function curve, or, like, the one wrong number curve, where dialing 90% of my phone number correctly does not get you 90% of Elias Ryukowski. Right. Um, so similarly, like dialing 90% of human correctly does not get you a human. So or I'm 90 percent of a human, 90 percent of a scientist. That there's this architectural thing between humans and chimps. I think it's more about the social dynamic of we manage to have a functioning social. Why, why can't we raise chimps to, to be scientists? Um, most animals can't be raised to be anything in our society. Most animals aren't domesticatable. It's a matter of whether they evolved the social uh, instincts to work together. But Robin, do you actually think that if we could like sort of mysteriously Domestic, that if we could domesticate chimps, they would make good scientists, and they, they would certainly be able to do a lot of things in our society. So, uh, and there are a lot of roles in even scientific labs that don't require that much intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, so they can be journal editors, but the, but can they actually be innovators? For example, I like the <laughs> let's take let's take more questions. My sympathies. Um. <laughs> So Professor Hansen, you, you seem to be um, you seem to have the idea that social skill is one of the things that separate one of the main things that separate humans from um, chimpanzees. So can you envision a um, a scenario where one of the computers had not like acquired this social skill and come to the other computers and say like Hey guys, you know like we can <laughs> we can start a revolution here. Maybe that's the first mover that. So uh, might, the, that, that might be the first so mover. One of the nice things about the vast majority of software in our world is that it's really quite socially compliant. 
Uh, you, you know, that if you, you can take a chimpanzee and bring him in, you can show him some tasks, and then he can do it for a couple of hours. And then just like sometime randomly in the next week, he'll go crazy and smash everything. And that you know, ruins their entire productivity. Uh, software doesn't do that so often. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no comment? So, so, <laughs> point to code review. <laughs> right, so software is, the way it's designed, it's set up to be relatively socially compliant. So, uh, assuming that we continue having software like that, we're relatively safe. If you go out and design software like wild chimps that can just go crazy and smash stuff once in a while, I don't, don't think I want to buy yourself. I don't know if this <laughs> sorry I don't know if this sidesteps the issue, but to what extent do either of you think uh, something like government classification or the desire of some more powerful body to innovate and then keep what it innovates secret could affect centralization um, to the extent you were talking about? I, I mean, as far as I can tell, what happens when the government tries to develop AI is nothing. Um, but that could just be an artifact of our local technological level, and it might change over the next few decades. Um, I mean, to me, it seems like a sort of deeply confusing issue whose answer is probably not very complicated in an absolute sense. It's just, con it's more confu- I mean like, we know why it's difficult to build a star. You've got to gather a very large amount of interstellar hydrogen in one place. So we understand what sort of labor goes into a star and we know why a star is difficult to build. When it comes to building a mind, um, the, um, we, it, we don't know how to do it, so it seems very hard. We like query our brains to see, say, map, up, map, up, map, map us a strategy to build this thing and it, and it returns null, so it feels like it's a very difficult problem. But in point of fact, we don't actually know that the problem is difficult apart from being confusing. We understand the star building problem, so we know it's difficult. This, this one, we don't know how difficult it's going to be after it no, it's no longer confusing. So to me, the AI problem looks like a, um, you know, like, you get some, you know, it looks to me more like the sort of thing that um, the problem is finding bright enough researchers, bringing them together, letting them work on that problem um, instead of uh, demanding that they, they work on something where they're going to produce a progress report in two years which will validate the person who approved the grant and advance their career. And so um, the government has historically been tremendously bad at producing sort of like basic research progress in AI. Um, in part because the most senior people in AI are often people who got to be very senior by having failed to build it for the longest period of time. Um, this is not a universal statement. I, I've met smart senior people in AI, but, but nonetheless. So, I mean, get, basically I'm not very afraid of the government because I don't think it's a throw warm bodies at the problem and I don't think it's throw warm computers at the problem. I, I think it's sort of a good, good methodology, uh, good people selection, letting them do sufficiently blue sky stuff and, I, and um, so far, historically, the government has just been tremendously bad at producing um, th th that kind of uh, progress. So when, th when they have a great big pro project, and when they have a great big project and try to build something, it doesn't work. I when, when, they, when they fund long-term research. I agree with Eliezer that in general, you too often go down the route of trying to grab something before it's grabbable. But th there is the scenario that like, in, certainly in the midst of a total war, when you have a technology that seems to have strong military applications and not much other applications, you'd be wise to keep that. Uh, application like within the nation uh, or, or your side of the alliance of the war, but there's too much of a temptation to f use that sort of thinking when you're not in a war or when the technology isn't like directly military applicable but has several steps of indirection. Uh, you can often just screw it up <laughs> by trying to keep it secret. That is, your trade off is between trying to keep it secret and getting this advantage versus putting this technology into the pool of technologies that the entire world develops together and shares. And uh, usually that's the better way to get advantage out of it unless you can, again, oh. identify oh. a very strong military application well, that, that, in particular. That sounds use. like a plausible piece of economic logic, but um, it sounds like, the, but it seems plausible to the same extent as the economic logic which says there should obviously never be wars because it, there's always, they're never preto optimal. There's always a situation where you didn't spend any of your resources on attacking each other, which was better. And it sounds like the economic which says that economic logic which says that there should never be any any, any unemployment compared because of Ricardo's law of comparative advantage means it's always better to there's always someone who can benefit you, you, who you can trade with, um, and the um, if you if you look at the the, the the state of present 
world technological development, there's basically either published research or proprietary research. We do not see corporations in sort of like close networks where they trade their research with each other, but not with the outside world. Um, there, there's, there's, um, there's either published research with all the attendant free rider problems that implies, or there's proprietary research. Um, as far as I know, may this room correct me if I'm mistaken, there is not a, a uh, set of like three leading trading firms well, which are trading all of their internal innovations with each other and not with the outside if, if world. If you're a software country, company and you locate in Silicon Valley, you've basically agreed that a lot of your secrets will leak out as your employees come in and leave your company. So. Uh, Choosing where to locate a company is often a choice to accept a certain level of leakage uh, of what happens within you in order to trade for the leakage from the other companies back toward you. So in fact, people who choose to move to those areas in those industries do in fact choose to have a set of... But th that's, that's, not, that's not trading innovations with each other and not with the rest of the outside world. That, I mean, like I can't actually even think of where we would see that pattern. That's, it is more trading with the people in the area than with the rest of the world. But, but, that, that is, but that, that's like coincidental side effect trading. That's not well, that, deliberate. That's why might places you scratch like that get back. the big advantage, because you go there and lots of stuff gets traded back and forth. Yes, but that's a commons. It's, it's like, sort of like a lesser form of publication. It's not a question of me offering this company an innovation in exchange well, for their probably innovation. Probably a little sidetracked. Uh, other... <laughs> this is actually relevant to, to this little yeah. um, So it seems to me that there's a, there's a sort of conflict between the economic, sorry. It seems to me that there's both an economic and social incentive for people to release partial results and imperfect products and you know steps along the way, which it seems would tend to yield a more gradual approach towards towards this breakthrough that we've been discussing. Is that do you, do you disagree? I mean, I know you disagree, but why do you disagree? Well, I, I mean, here at the Singularity Institute, we plan to keep all of our most important insights private and hope that everyone else releases their results. <laughs> which. Human-inspired innovations haven't worked that way, which I well, guess so we certainly hope way. everyone else thinks that way. I mean, usually you'll have a policy about having these things leak, but in fact, you make very social choices that you know will lead to leaks, and you accept those leaks as a con as a and trade for the other advantages that those policies bring. Often they are that you will get leaks from others. So locating yourself in a in a city where there are lots of other firms, sending your people to conferences where other people are going to the same conferences, those are often ways right. in which you end up <coughs> leaking and getting leaks in trade. So the team in the basement won't release anything until they've got the thing that's going to take over the world. Right, we were, we were not planning to have any um, windows in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we think that... that was, uh, wait, for, wait for the... Uh, if anyone has a microphone yeah. that can be set up over here, I will happily donate this uh, microphone. Sure. So why do we think that uh, if we manage to create artificial human brain, that it would immediately work much, much faster than human brain? What if, if a team in the basement makes uh, artificial human brain, but it works at one billionth the speed of human brain? And wouldn't that give other teams enough time to catch up? It, it depends on the, so, um, so first of all, the, the, the course visualizing is not like building a human brain in your basement because um, we can, you know, like based on what we already understand about intelligence, we don't understand everything, but we understand some things and what we understand seems to me to be quite sufficient to tell you that the human brain is a completely crap design, um, which is why I can't solve the waste and selection task. Um, there's, there's, you pick up any bit of the heuristics and biases literature and, and there's like 100 different ways that this thing exper reliably experimentally malfunctions when, when you like give it some simple seeming problems. Um, so you wouldn't want, actually want to build anything that worked like the human brain. Um, it would be like sort of miss the entire point of trying to build a better intelligence. But if you were to scan a brain, then, then this is more something Robin has studied in, in more detail than I have, um, then whether you know, the first one might run at 1,000th your speed or might run at 1,000 times your speed. It depends on the hardware overhang, on the, what the cost of computing power happens to be at the point where your scanners get good enough. Or your is that, is that fair? Sorry? Or your modelers get enough, good enough. Actually, you know, the scanner being the last thing isn't such a threatening scenario because then you'd have a big consortium get together to do the last scan where it's finally cheap enough. But the modeling being the last thing is more s disruptive because it's just more uncertain when modeling gets done. But by modeling, you mean? The, the actual modeling of the brain cells in terms of. 
translating oh, I, a scan into oh, it. Oh, I see. So in other words, if there's if there's known scans, but you can't model the brain cells, then right. there's a then there's an even worse last mile problem. Right. Exactly. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I can. Um, I, I mean, like I would I would I would hope to build an AI that was sufficiently unlike human because it worked better that there would be no direct concept of how fast does this run relative to you. It would be able to solve some problems very quickly. And if it can solve all problems much faster than you, you're already getting into the super intelligence range. But you know, at the beginning, you would already expect it to be able to do arithmetic Im immensely faster than you. And at the same time, it might you know, like be doing basic scientific research a bit slower. And then eventually, it's faster than you at everything. But possibly not the first time you boot up the code. So uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to envision uh, intelligence explosions that, that sort of uh, win Robin over to Yudkowsky's uh, position. And uh, so does uh, either one of these, uh, or maybe a combination of both, you know, uh, self-improving software or, uh, you know, nanobots that build better nanobots, does that, is that, is that unstable enough or, or, or you still sort of feel that would be a, so a widespread benefit? The, the, the key debate we're having isn't about the f rate of change that might eventually happen. It's about how local that rate of change might start. So uh, if you take the software, self-improving software, of course, we have software that self-improves. It just does a lousy job of it. <laughs> so if you imagine steadily improvement in the self-improvement, then uh, that doesn't give a local team a strong advantage. You have to imagine that there's some clever insight that gives a local team a vast, cosmically vast advantage in its ability to self-improve compared to the other teams such that not only can it self-improve, but it self-improves like gangbusters in a very short time. So with nanobots, again, uh, if, there's a, if there's a threshold where you have nothing like a nanobot and then you have lots of them that are cheap, that's more of a threshold kind of situation. And again, that's something that the nanotechnology literature had a speculation about a while ago. I think the consensus moved a little more against that in the sense that people realized uh, those sort of imagined nanobots just wouldn't be as economically viable as some more, uh, you know, larger scale manufacturing process to make them. But um, again, it's the issue of, of whether there's that sharp threshold where you're almost there and it's just not good enough because you don't really have anything, and then you finally pass the threshold, and now you've got vast power. So, so, so what do you? Oh, sorry, were you about to? Okay. No. Uh, so, what do you think you know, and how do you think you know it with respect to this particular issue of that which yields? Um, the power of human intelligence is made up of a thousand pieces or like a thousand different required insights. I mean, I, 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 what, is, is this something that should be seen more plausible in principle? I mean, where does that actually come from? So one set of sources is just what we've learned as economists and, and social scientists about innovation in our society and where it comes from that innovation in our society comes from lots of little things accumulated together. It rarely comes from one big thing. It, it's usually a few good ideas and then lots and lots of detail worked out. That's sort of generically how innovation works in our society and has for a long time. So that's sort of a clue about the nature of what makes things work well. Is that they usually have some architecture and then there's just lots of detail and you have to get it right before something really works. Uh, and then in the AI field in particular, uh, there's also this large I was in the artificial intelligence researcher for nine years, but it was a while ago. And in, the art, in that field in particular, there's this, the old folks in the field tend to have the sense that people come up with new models, but if you look at their new models, people remember a while back when people had something a lot like that, except they called it a, 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 a different name, and they say, fine, you have a new name for it. You can keep reinventing new names and new architectures, but they keep cycling among sort of a similar set of concepts for architectures, and they don't really come up with something very dramatically different. They just come up with different ways of repackaging different pieces in the architecture for artificial intelligence. So th there was a sense to which, you know, maybe we'll find the right combination, but it's not, you know, it's clear that there's just a lot of pieces together. So in particular, Douglas Lennett uh, did the system that you and I both respect called Eurisco a while ago that had this nice simple architecture and was able to self-modify and was able to grow itself, but its growth ran out and ran slowed down and it kept, it just couldn't improve itself very far, even though it seemed to have a nice elegant architecture for doing so. And Lennett concluded, with I agree with him, that the reason it couldn't go very far is it just didn't know very much. And the key to making something like that work was to just collect a lot more knowledge 
and put it in so it had more to work with. But, but Lenat's to still trying to do that 15 years later, and so far, Psych does not seem to work even as well as Eurisco. Uh, Psych is pretty, does some pretty impressive stuff. I'll agree that it's not going to replace humans anytime soon, but it's I mean, an it, it seems to me that, that Psych is an iota of evidence against this view. I mean, like, that's, that's what Psych was supposed to do. You're supposed to put in lots of knowledge, and then it was supposed to go foom. Well, and it was, it totally it was did supposed it. to be enough knowledge, and it was never, never clear how much is required, so apparently. Oh. Okay, but, 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 but clearly Lennon thought there was some possibility it was going to go foom the next 15 years. So, you know, there's, right. there's I mean, like, it's not that this is quite well, unfalsifiable. Is, it's just been sort of incrementally more and more falsified. I can point to a number falsified. of senior AI researchers who would take, basically agree with my point of view that this AI foom scenario is very unlikely. So this is actually more of a consensus, really, among senior I'm, AI researchers. I, I'd like to see that poll, actually, because I could point to AI you know, so, like AI researchers in, who in agree fact, with the, triple, the opposing view as well. Like, triple AI yeah. pa has a panel where they have a white paper where they're coming out and saying explicitly, you know, this explosive AI view, we don't find that plausible. Which, are, we, are we talking about um, the one with, uh, what's his name from? Norvig? Eric Horvitz? Or? Horvitz, yeah. Uh, was Norvig on that? I don't, I don't, I don't think know. Norvig was on that. But anyway, Norvig just has a, like a paper, I guess, that he, Norvig just made the press in the last day or so arguing with, uh, about linguistics with Chomsky saying that this idea that there's a simple, elegant theory of linguistics is just wrong. It's just a lot of messy detail. Get linguistics right, which is a similar sort of idea. There is no we, we have, architecture. I think we have a refocusing question from the audience. <laughs> but wait, 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 wait for the microphone. Wait for the microphone. <laughs> okay, so this intelligence has to interact with the world to be able to take over it. Um, so you know, if we had this box and we were going to use it to try to make all the money in the world, we would still have to you know, talk to all the exchanges in the world and learn all the bugs in their protocol. And the way that we're able to do that is that there are humans at the exchanges that, you know, operate at our frequency and our level of intelligence. We can call them and ask questions. And this box, if it's a million times smarter than the exchanges, like it still has to move at the speed of the exchanges to be able to work with them and eventually make all the money available on them. And then if it wants to make, you know, take over the world through war, it has to be able to build weapons, which means like mining and building factories and doing all these things that are really slow and also require extremely high dimensional knowledge that seems to have nothing to do with just like how fast it can think. Like no matter how fast you can think, it's gonna take a long time to build a factory that can build tanks. So how is this thing so th going this to is, take over the world? When so, so the sort of like um, analogy that I use here is imagine um, you have two people having an argument um, sort of just before, like just after the dawn of human intelligence, there's these two aliens in a spaceship, neither of whom have ever seen a biological intelligence. We're going to totally like skip over how this could possibly happen coherently. Um, but there's these two observers in spaceships who have only ever seen Earth, and they're watching these sort of like new creatures who have intelligence. They're arguing over how fast can these creatures progress. And one of them says, well, you know, it doesn't matter how smart they are. They've got no access to ribosomes. They, you know, there's like no access from the brain to the ribosomes. They're not going to be developed, be able to develop any sort of new limbs or make honey or, you know, like spit venom. So really we've just got these squishy things running around with, without very much of an advantage for all their intelligence because they can't actually make anything because they don't have ribosomes. Um, and the, the, we eventually bypassed that whole sort of existing infrastructure and built our own factory systems um, that ran on, that, that had a more convenient access to us. Um, and, and similarly, there's all this sort of infrastructure out, out there, but it's all infrastructure that we created. And the new system does not necessarily have to use our infrastructure if it can build its own infrastructure. And as for how fast that might happen, well, in point of fact, we actually popped up with all these factories on a very rapid time scale compared to the amount of time it took natural selection to produce ribosomes. We were able to build our own new infrastructure much more quickly than, the previous, than it took to create the previous infrastructure. And that's what the, and to put it on a very concrete level, if you can crack the protein folding problem, you can email a DNA string to one of these services that will send you um, back the um, proteins that you asked for with the 72 hour turnaround time. And that may sound like, and, it may, and three days may sound like a very short period of time to build your own economic infrastructure relative to how long we're used to it taking. But in point of fact, this is just the cleverest way that I could think of to do it. And 72 hours would work out to, I don't even know how long, at a million to one speed up rate. It would be like thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. Um, so it, there might be some even faster way to get your own infrastructure is than this, the is DNA Is this basic argument something YouTube 
roughly agree on or roughly disagree on? I think we agree on the specific answer to the question, but we agree differ, we differ on how to frame it, and I think it's relevant to our discussion. I would say our civilization has vast capacity, and most of the power of that capacity is a mental capacity. We, as a civilization, have a vast mental capacity. We are able to think about a lot of things and calculate and figure out a lot of things. So if there's a box somewhere that has a mental capacity comparable to the rest of human civilization, I got to give it some respect and figure it can do a hell of a lot of stuff. I might quibble with the idea that if it were just intelligent, it would have that mental capacity because it comes down to, well, this thing was improving what about itself exactly? So uh, there's the issue of what, what various kinds of things does it take to produce various kinds of mental capacities? And I'm less enamored of the idea that there's this intelligence thing. If it's just intelligent enough, it doesn't matter what it knows. It's just really smart. And I'm not sure that concept makes sense. But or it can, learn, it, can, it can learn much faster than you can learn. It doesn't necessarily have to go through college the way you did because it is able to much more rapidly learn either by observing reality directly or, I mean, in point of fact, given our current state of society, you can't just cheat, you can't just download it from the internet. But simply positing it has a great mental capacity, then I will be in fear of what it does. The uh, question is, how does it get that capacity? Uh, well, uh, well I, actually, would the audience be terribly offended if I sort of like tried to answer that one a bit? I mean, so the thing is, um, there's, there's a number of places the step function can, can come in. We could have a historical step function like what happens to, from humans to chimps. We could have the combined effect of sort of all the obvious ways to rebuild an intelligence if you're not doing it evolutionarily. I mean, like, you, you build an AI, and it's on a 2 gigahertz chip instead of 200 hertz neurons and it has complete read and write access to all the pieces of itself, and it can do repeatable mental processes and like, run its own internal controlled experiments on what sort of mental processes work better, and, and then like, copy it onto new pieces of code. And it, uh, like, unlike this hardware, where we're stuck with a certain amount of hardware, if this intelligence works well enough, it can buy or perhaps simply steal very large amounts of computing power from the large computing clusters that we have out there. Um, and it, it, um, if, if you want to solve a problem, there's no way that you can allocate, sort of reshuffle, reallocate like internal resources to different aspects of it. To me, it looks like architecturally, if we've got, if we've sort of like got down the basic insights that, that underlying human intelligence, and we can add all the cool stuff that we could do if we were just, if we were that if we were designing an artificial intelligence instead of being stuck, stuck with the ones that evolution ac accidentally burped out. Um, it looks like they should have these enormous advantages. And I mean, like, we may have six billion people on this planet, but they don't really add that way. Six billion humans are not six billion times as smart as one human. I can't even imagine what that planet would look like. Um, it's, it's been known for a long time that buying twice as many researchers does not get you twice as much science. It gets you twice as many science papers. It does not get you twice as much scientific progress. Um, here, here we have some other people in the Singularity Institute who have developed theses like, like that, that I wouldn't know how to defend myself and which are more extreme than I am to the effect that you know, if you buy twice as much science, you get like flat output or like even like it actually goes down because now you've got, you decrease the signal to noise ratio. Um, but now I'm getting a, a bit off track. And where does this enormous power come from? I mean, it seems like human brains are just not all that impressive. We don't add that well. We can't communicate with other people. Um, one billion squirrels could not compete with the human brain. Um, like, our brain is about four times as large as a chimp, but you know, like four chimps cannot compete with one human. The scaling factor of a, it, it, like making a brain twice as large produces a, and actually incorporating that into the architecture seems to produce a scaling of output of intelligence that is like not even remotely comparable to the effect of taking two brains of fixed size and letting them talk to each other using words. Um, so like an artificial intelligence that can do all, the, do all this neat stuff internally and possibly scale its processing power by orders of magnitude and th that, that itself has a completely different output function than, um, y than, than human brains trying to talk to each other. I mean, to, to me, the, the notion that you can have something incredibly powerful and yes, more powerful than our um, sad little civilization of, of six billion people flapping their lips at each other, running on 200 hertz brains is you know, like not actually all that implausible. So there are devices that think and they are very useful. So 70% of world income goes to pay for creatures who have these 
devices that think, and they are very, very useful. It's a, more of an open question, though, how much of that use is because they are a generic good thinker or because they know many useful particular things. So I'm less assured of this idea that you just have a generically smart thing and it's not smart about anything at all in particular. It's just smart in the abstract and that it's vastly more powerful because it's smart in the abstract compared to things that know a lot of concrete things about particular things. Most of the employees you have in this firm or in other firms, they are useful not just because they were generically smart creatures, but because they learned a particular job. They learned about how well, to do the well, job well, from well, experience of other people on the job and practice, things like that. So, well, well, no, first you needed some very smart people and then you taught them the job. You, Right. You know, if you t if you try to, I mean, like I don't know what your function over here looks like, but I suspect if if you like take every a bunch of people who are like thirty IQ points down the curve and try to teach them the same job, you, I'm not quite sure what would happen then, but I would guess that your corporation would probably fall a bit in the rankings of financial firms over those get computed. Um, but humans, so there's the question of what it means. And, and, and you know, like and thirty IQ points is just like this tiny little mental difference compared to any of the actual like we are going to t reach in and change around the machinery and give you different brain areas. I mean, like 30 IQ points is nothing, and yet it makes, seems to make this very large out difference in practical Here, output. When we look at people's mental abilities across a wide range of facts, we do a, a task, we do a factor analysis of that. We get the dominant factor, the, the ma biggest eigenvalue, the, the eigenvector with the biggest eigenvalue, and that we call intelligence. It's the thing that explains the most, the, the one-dimensional thing that explains the most correlation across different tasks. It doesn't mean that there is, and therefore, an abstract thing you can build into an abstract thing, machine that gives you that factor. It means that actual real humans are correlated in that way. And then the question is, what causes that correlation? One, there are many plausible things. One, for example, is simply a sort of mating. People who are smart in some ways mate with other people who are smart in other ways. That produces a correlation across there. Another could be that there's just an overall strategy that some minds are just to devote more resources to different kinds of tasks. There doesn't need to be any central abstract thing that you can make a mind do that lets it solve lots of problems simultaneously for there to be this IQ factor in correlation. So then why humans? Why weren't there 20 different species that got Again, good at doing different things? We grant that there is something that, what, that changed with humans, but that doesn't mean that there's this vast landscape of uh, intelligence you can create that's billions of times smarter than us just by rearranging the architecture. That's the key thing. I mean, I mean, and, and for, I mean, it seems to me that for this particular argument to carry, it's not enough to say you need content. You've got to have, there, there has to be no master lit trick to learning or producing content. And, and there in particular, I mean, like, I, mean, like I, I can't really actually say Bayesian updating because you know, like doing it on the like, full distribution is not computationally tractable. You need to be able to approximate it somehow. Right. Um, but, but nonetheless, there's like this sort of core trick called learning or Bayesian updating. And you, know, you look at human civilization, there was this core trick called science. There wasn't this um, sort of, there, there, it's, it's not that like um, this, 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 uh, the science of figuring out uh, chemistry was developed in one place and it used something other than the experimental method compared to the science of biology that was developed in another place. Sure, there were specialized skills that were developed afterward. There was also a core insight, and then people practiced the core insight, and they did start developing further specialized skills over a very short time scale compared to previous civilizations before that insight had occurred. I mean, it, it, it's, it's difficult to look over history and think of a good case where there has been, um, like, like, like if, 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 short as, where is the absence of the master trick which lets you rapidly generate content? Um, I mean, like the. It, it, Maybe the agricultural revolution. Maybe for the agricultural revolution, well, even for the agricultural revolution, first there's the, the there's the master trick. I'm going to grow plants, but and then there's like developing skills of growing. There's a, bunch a of different large plants. literature on technological and economic innovation, and it basically says the vast majority of innovation is lots of small gains. Uh, you could look at like locomotives and when locomotives got faster and were energy efficient. You could look at lots of particular devices, and basically you look, do some curve of how well they got over time, and it's basically lots of little steps over time that slowly made them better. This right, is, th th this is what I expect a super intelligence to look like after the sort of initial self-improvements passes and it's doing like sort of incremental gains, but then you know, like in the beginning there's also these very large insights um, along, well, and that, that's, that's where what the, we're debating. Uh, other questions? Or? Sorry. Uh, actually, um, before, uh, Craig, you can take this, but uh, can you, can everybody without 
making a big disruption uh, pass your votes to this side of the room and we can tabulate them and uh, see what the answers are, but continue with the questions. And remember, um, yes is this side of the room and no is that side of the room. <laughs> I just kind of wanted to make sure I understood the relevance of some of the things we're talking about. So I, I think you both agree that if the time it takes to get from a machine that's, let's say, like kind of a tenth as effective as humans to, let's say, kind of like ten times as effective as humans at whatever these being smart tasks are, like making better AI or whatever, um, that if, if that time is shorter, then it's more likely to be localized? Just kind of the, the, the sign of the derivative there. Is that agreed upon? I, I think I agree with that. But you agree I, with it? I think when you hypothesize this path of going from one tenth to ten times, uh, Robin, you hypothesize step to the microphone. a global path where it's doing its own self improvement, or are you hypothesizing a global path where all the machines well, in the world are Robin, let's, let's say that it, the microphone. <laughs> it takes a fairly, uh, let's say it just turns out to take a fairly small amount of time to get from, one, from that one point to the other point. But it's a global process. Is in, no, I, I'm saying, how does the fact that it's a short amount of time affect the probability that it's local versus global? Well. Like if, if you just have received that knowledge. Well, on time, it would be the, diff, the relative scale of different time scales. So if, you're, if you, okay. it takes a year, but we're in a eco world economy that doubles every month, then a year is a long time. Uh, so it's, it's, you yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about from one-tenth human power to ten times. So I think we're right. not yet. We probably don't have an economy at that point that's, that's doubling every month. I, I would, well, the point at least is, not because of the, the point is that time scale uh, you know, if that's a global time scale, if the world is, if, you know, new, th new issues are showing up every day that are 1% better, and that adds up to that over a period of a year, but everybody shares those innovations every day, then we have a global development. If we've got one group that has a development and jumps a factor of two all by itself without is, any other input, then you've got a more local is, development, is there, right? is there any industry in which there's a group of people who share innovations with each other and who could punish someone who defected by me using the innovations without publishing their own? I mean, like, is there any industry that works like that? But in all industries, in fact, there's a lot of leakage. I mean, this is just generically how industries work, how innovation works in, in our world. Uh, people try to keep things secret, but they fail, Ooh. and things leak out. And so teams don't, in fact, get that much further ahead of other teams. But you, if you're willing to spend a bit more money, you can keep secrets. You know, like, why don't they then, right? Well, why some, don't firms some, actually some, keep more secrets? The NSA actually does. So when somebody, and they succeed. You thought it, it was more likely to be local if it happens faster. You didn't think the opposite. Well, Spencer, what else you're holding constant? Obviously, I agree that holding every, all the other speeds constant, making that faster, makes it more likely to be open. OK, so hold, holding all other speed co constant, increasing the relative okay. speed of something, makes it more likely to be local. Right. OK, and that's why. You are, that, that's where we get the relevance of whether it's one or two or three key insights versus if it's lots of small things. Right. Because lots of small things will take more time to accumulate. Right, and they leak. So, they leak. But in some sense, it's easier to leak one key idea, like, you know, uh, when? you know, Gaussian processes or something, than it is to leak. You know, a vast database <laughs> of uh, you know knowledge that's all kind of linked together in a in a useful way. Well, it's not about the time scale leak. So you have some insights. You have thirty of them that other people don't have, but they have thirty that you don't. You're leaking. They're spreading across. Your sort of overall advantage might be relatively small, even though you've got thirty things they don't. But there's just lots of different ones. When there's the, one thing, and it's the only one thing that matters, then it's more likely that one team has and other ones don't at some point. I mean, like I, I, you know. Like maybe the singular institute will have like five insights, and then like the other like ten or insights or whatever would, would come would be published by industry or something by people who like didn't quite realize how important those you know that that, that uh, who has these insights is an issue. I mean, I would prefer more secrecy generally because that gives like more of a advantage to localized concentrations of intelligence, which makes me feel slightly better about the, the, the main here clearly has, issue has to be how different is this technology from other ones. If we, if we are willing to posit that this is like other familiar technology, we have a vast experience based on how often one team gets how far ahead of another. And they often get pretty darn far. Is there a microphone? 
I mean, like the, the, it seems to me like the history of technology is full of cases where one team gets way, way, way ahead of, all, of another team. Way ahead on a relatively narrow thing. So you're imagining you're getting way ahead on the entire idea of mental capacity. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm getting, you're imagining getting, getting, getting ahead, ahead on, on the. on everything. No, I'm, I'm imagining getting ahead on this, you know, sort of relatively narrow single technology of intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> So I think intelligence is like betterness, right? It's a name for this vast range of things we all care about. And, and I think it's the sort of machine which you know, like has a certain design and turns out better and better stuff. But there's this one feature called intelligence. Well, no, it's this machine you build. So, intelligence is, describes the work that it does, but it's still like an automobile. Like, it, it, like you could say, like, what is this mysterious forwardness that New an automobile possesses? New York City possesses? is a good city. It's a great city. It's a better city. Where do you go to look to see the betterness of New York City? It's just in thousands of little things. There is no one thing that makes New York City better. Right, whereas I think intelligence is more like a car. It's like a machine. It has a function. It, it outputs stuff. It's not like a city that's you know, like all over the place. So, um, so if you could basically, uh, Robin, so if you could take, um, say, a scanner brain and you know, run it 20 times faster, like, do you think that's probable? Do you think that won't happen in one place suddenly? And if you think that it's possible, why don't you think it'll lead to a local boom? So now we're talking about whole brain emulation scenario for, we're talking about brain scans then, right? Sure, just as, um, just as a path to AI. So if brains can run, if brain, if artificial emulations of brains can run 20 times faster than human brains, but no one team can make their emulations run cost effectively, 20 times more cost effectively than any other team's emulations, then you have a new economy with cheaper emulations, which is more productive and grows faster and everything, but it's not, there's not a local advantage that one group gets over another. I, I don't know if Carl Schulman talked to you about this, but I think he did an analysis suggesting that if you can run your M's 10% faster, then everyone buys their M's from you as opposed to anyone else, which is itself contradicted to some extent by a recent study, I think it was a McKinsey study, showing that, um, that productivity varies between factories by a factor of five and still takes a while for the less efficient ones, to, like still takes 10 years for the less efficient ones to go out of business. That was on my blog a few days ago. Ah, um, but that explains why I heard about it. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, so, so, uh, but, but, but nonetheless, um, so in Carl Schulman's version of this, like whoever has an M is 10% faster soon controls the entire market. And would you agree or disagree that that was likely to happen? I mean, I think there's always these fears people have that if one team we're competing with gets a little bit better on something, then they'll take over everything. But it's just a lot harder to take over everything because there's always a lot of different dimensions on which things can be better, and it's hard to be consistently better on a lot of things all at once. So being 10% better at one thing is not usually a huge advantage. Even being twice as good at one thing is not often that big. And, and I think I'll actually like concede the point in real life, but only because the market is inefficient. Behind you? We, uh, we, we're Out of time? Yeah, I think we, we're trying to keep it to 90 minutes, and uh, you right. both have done a great job. Uh, we maybe take What's a couple minutes each to, we did, I have, I have, the, oh, I okay. have the results, so there'll be pre-wrapping uh, up comments, but if you want to pull, want to take maybe three minutes to, to sum up your view, or do you want to just want to sure. pull the plug? Sure. Um, uh, I respect Eli Eisier greatly. He's a smart guy. I'm glad that if somebody's going to work on this problem, it's him. I agree that there is a chance that it's real. I agree that somebody should be working on it. The issue on which we disagree is how large a probability is this scenario relative to other scenarios that I fear get neglected because this one looks so sexy. Uh, there is a temptation in science fiction and in lots of fiction to imagine that this one evil genius in the basement lab comes up with this great innovation that lets them perhaps take over the world unless Bond's, Bond sneaks in and listens to his long speech about why he's going to kill him. And, you know, et cetera. Uh, and it's just uh, such an attractive fantasy, but that's not how innovation typically happens in the world. Real innovation has lots of different sources. It's lo usually lots of small pieces. It's rarely big chunks that give huge, huge advantages. And eventually we will have machines that will have lots of mental capacity. They'll be able to do a lot of things. We will move a lot of the content we have in our heads over to these machines. But uh, I don't see the scenario being very likely whereby one guy in a basin suddenly has some grand formula, some grand theory of architecture that allows this machine to grow to be from being a tiny thing that hardly knows anything to taking over the world in a couple of weeks. 
that requires such vast, powerful architectural advantages for this thing to have that I just don't find it very plausible. I think it's possible, just not very likely. And that's the point on which I guess we disagree. Uh, and so I think more attention should go to other disruptive scenarios where there are the emulations, maybe there'd be a hardware overhang, um, and other big issues that, sh that we should take seriously in these uh, various disruptive future scenarios. I agree that growth could happen very quickly. Growth could go more quickly at a world scale. The issue is how local will it be? So it seems to me that th this is all sort of strongly dependent first on the belief that intelligence gets divided, that, pardon me, the, the, that w the causes of intelligence get divided up very finely into lots of little pieces that get developed in a wide variety of different places that nobody gets an advantage. And second, that if you do get a small advantage, um, you're only doing a very small fraction of the like total intellectual labor going to the problem, so you don't have you know, like a, a nuclear pile, pile gone critical effect because any given pile is still a very small fraction of all the thinking that's going into AI everywhere. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what to say besides like when I look at the world, um, it doesn't actually look like the world looks like that. I mean, there, there, weren't, there, there aren't like 20 different species, all, all of whom are good at different aspects of intelligence and, and have different advantages. Um, it's, it's not the case uh, um, that, that it, there, there's, I mean like G factor is pretty weak evidence, but it, it exists and um, the, there are, you know, it, it, the, the, the people talking about G factor do seem to be like winning on the experimental predictions test versus the people who previously went around talking about multiple intelligences. Um, when I, I mean, it's, it's, not very, it's not a very transferable argument, but to the extent that I actually have a grasp of cognitive science and, and try to figure out how this works, it does not look like it's sliced into lots of little pieces. It looks like there's, you know, like a, there's, you know, like a bunch of major systems doing particular tasks and they're all cooperating with each other. I mean, like, it's, it's sort of like we have a heart and not like 100 little mini hearts distributed around the body. It might have been a sort of better system, but nonetheless, we just have one big heart over there. Um, I, it looks to me like you, human intelligence is sort of like um, that there's like sort of really obvious, hugely important things you could do with like the first prototype intelligence that actually worked. And so I expect that the sort of critical thing is going to be the first prototype intelligence that actually works and, and runs on a two gigahertz processor and can like do little experiments to find out which of its own mental processes work better um, and, and things like that and is going to, and that the first AI that really works is going to have a large, already going to have a pretty large advantage um, relative to the biological system um, so, so that um, the sort of like key driver of change looks more like somebody builds a prototype and not like um, this large existing industry reaches a certain quality level at the point where it is being mainly driven by incremental improvements leaking out of particular organizations. Um, there's, uh, there, there are various issues we did not get into at all, like um, the extent to which uh, this might still look like a bad thing or not from human perspective because um, you know, you, you know, like even if it, even if it's non-local, there's still this particular group that got left behind by the whole thing, which was the ones with the biological brains that couldn't be upgraded at all, um, and uh, various sort of other things. But uh, I guess that's mostly my summary of, of where this particular debate seems to stand. So, it's honored to be with you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, in this highly unscientific tally with the number of problems, uh, uh, we start off with 45 for and 40 against, and uh, I guess unsurprisingly, a, a very uh, compelling arguments from both parts. Fewer people had an opinion. So <laughs> now we've uh, gone to uh, 33 against and 32 for. So against lost seven and four lost 13. So we have a lot more undecided people than before. I guess uh, against has it. Thank you very much.